God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Let me call your attention to the book of Genesis, the 13th chapter, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. And in verse 14, you find these words recorded. After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. I am giving all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction for I am giving it to you. Verse 14 says, After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, Look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. I am giving you all this land as far as you can see. I want to speak this New Year's subject, 2020 vision, 2020 vision. Well, here we are, days away, if the Lord permits that we would enter into a new year. And it's sort of a big one. 2020. It sounds so futuristic. I remember being a movie fan and a horror fan and a, a sci-fi fan. In 1968, there was a big hit called 2001 Space Odyssey. A big hit I didn't care for the movie, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but I remember when the movie came out and the title alone, 2001. And I remember thinking back then, I'll be dead by then. <laughs> I mean, it just sounded so far. It sounded so distant in the future. What will that be like in 2001? And now here we are, made it to that and past that. They even made a sequel to this in 1984 called 2010. And now that is history. That is in the past. During New Year's time, particularly with this 2020, it, it's natural for us to look back, reminisce on where we have come from. The advancements, things that have come and gone, our society, our technology. Now I was thinking about this this week, I remember the old TVs, I am old enough to remember that there was a time when TV used to go off the air. Yeah. Yeah. Some old folks here. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, it didn't run 24 hours a day. If, if you were up at midnight, 1 o'clock, it usually would end with the national anthem. And then you would get this picture. This, along with the screeching sound, which I'm going to spare you this morning. And that was in case you fell asleep. With your TV on, that would wake you up. And back then, all TVs, everything was in black and white. When color TV came out, they changed it and they put these pretty color bars up there. And it told you that TV is now off the air. See you in the morning, 6.30, 7 o'clock, and it would come back on. It seems like such a long time ago that that was the norm. When we look back as we enter into the year 2000, which was a big deal because we were not only turning a page in the year, but we were entering a new century. And there was for a while, for those who remember, question about whether or not we were even going to make it into the year 2000. Because there was that Y2K phenomena that everybody feared and dreaded. The Y2K bug said that even then we were in a computer age and we were at 1999. What's going to happen when it clicks over to 2000? Will it even do that? Or will it just crash? Will it shut down? Will it reset itself to zero? We weren't certain. Didn't know. Wasn't sure. Remember people telling everybody, make sure your computer is turned off on December 31st. Shut it down because we don't know what's going to happen come midnight to your computer. And it was quite a serious thing. And for many people, they thought, not only is your computer going to crash, but we may be looking at Armageddon. Planes are going to fall out of the sky. Railroad trains are going to go off the tracks. We thought it was going to be near the end of the world. I know individuals who actually built bunkers in case there was mass chaos and famine and cannibalism. They were going to be zombies. The Y2K was coming to get us. And so there was a question about whether or not we would even make it. I remember watching on New Year's, the first New Year's was out in Malaysia. And all eyes, the news was peeled in to see what would happen there first, if this was going to domino its way over and just wreak havoc in our world. Well, we made it past then, we made it into the year 2000. Year 2000, Gladiator was the movie of the year. The Sopranos hit the airways. We were in a computer raid. Your computer in the year 2000 looked something like this. Mine looked something like that. Mine, of course, ran better. <laughs> Being a Mac. And the year 2000 was the invention of the thumb drive, the flash drive, still with us today. In the year 2000, a postage stamp was 33 cents. Gasoline was a dollar fifty-one a gallon. Milk was a dollar thirty a gallon. You get a dozen eggs, eighty-nine cents, and a loaf of bread was a dollar seventy-two. The average apartment rented for six fifty a month, and you could buy a house for an average of 125,000. Donna was out there selling them In the year 2000, 
the Baltimore Ravens won the Super Bowl, and the mighty New York Yankees won the World Series again. Hold your applause. We started saying goodbye to many things that were fading out that you hardly see anymore. If you were a doctor or a drug dealer, <laughs> you had one of these pagers. As we anticipated the new century, a lot of us wondered if we would be like the time of the Jetsons, would we be in our flying cars and our jetpacks? Well, we didn't make it to the flying cars and the jetpacks per se, but we did seem to surpass Captain Kirk's flip phone. And in the year 2000, your cell phone looked something like this, which was a serious upgrade from where it came from. And this picture really doesn't do justice to the scale because when you put them next to each other, the old cell phones were quite the object to carry around. So we have come a long way, and while we don't have the flying cars and the jetpacks, think about it. Our cell phones today, think about all the things this one little gadget can do for you. It's your address book. You don't need the Rolodex. You get text messages. For many people, it is a replacement of the watch, the clock, and the alarm. It's your calendar, your to-do list. It's a notepad. It's an MP3 player. You don't need a Walkman anymore. It's a camera, of course, and it takes us to the internet. An entirely new world, we get the emails. It's a calculator. It's a flashlight. And with a couple of Fancy free apps, you can turn it into a GPS. You can watch videos and movies and even live TV. Not too bad. And then of course, it can connect you to your favorite church. Amen. Yeah. So we've come a long way in just these past 20 years from 2000 to 2020. In 1970, Alvin Toffler wrote a book that was a big seller back then called Future Shock. He was a sociologist and a futurist. And his thesis, what he said, was that we are going to be experiencing change, advancements and developments. Now, this is not new. All through history, there has been change advancements, and developments. But what Alvin says is that in the coming years and in the current years of 1970, we have experienced more change in a shorter period of time than we have ever done before. In other words, he says we've experienced more change in the past 50 years than we did in the past 200 years. And if that was true then, it is certainly so much true now, just looking at some of the things we look back at. That over the past 20 years, we have had more developments and advancements than we have had over the past 100 years. And what Alvin says is that when that happens, humans can't keep up with the change. Change will bring stress. Any kind of change brings stress. Change your job. Change your residence. A certain amount of stress comes with that. Even good change brings stress. You get married, you get engaged. It's a change. It will bring stress. So stress is a normal response 
a natural response to change, but when you get so much change that you can't keep up with it, Calvin says you run into future shock, where it renders you almost immobile, where you become riddled with anxiety and fear, verging on panic because you don't know what's coming next. Every time you turn around, there's something new that you have to learn, something new that you have to adjust to. It makes you want to withdraw and say, just count me out. I can't keep up with everything that's going on. And it throws you into a state of uncertainty. And that uncertainty is not pleasant. You don't feel safe. You don't know what's going to happen next. This is what we have here in our story with Abraham. When we read Abraham, the patriarch, in Hebrews, the faith chapter, it says, by faith, Abraham was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Now, when we look at this text, this verse here, by faith, Abraham left his home and went into a strange land. Now, when you read through 11th chapter of Hebrew, you're reading all kinds of the faith heroes. They stopped the mouths of lions. They opened the Red Sea. They fought pharaohs. They raised the dead. A lot of tremendous, miraculous things that are credited to these people of faith. We get to Abraham, and what was his big feat? He left home and went to another country. We can say like, well, that doesn't seem like a real big deal. Yeah, sure, there was probably some anxiety. When we go to travel, we go through some inconvenience, maybe some language barriers, some money exchange issues. But for the most part, we can travel almost anywhere in the world and find a level of similarity to bring us some functionality and comfort. Wherever you go, you'll find a McDonald's somewhere. And so again, it doesn't seem like really such a big deal that Abraham left his country and went into another land. Did that really call for a whole lot of faith to do that? But in the ancient world, people didn't move around a lot. Because moving around was too uncertain. People died where they were born and where their ancestors were born. People did very little moving around. The philosopher Socrates, the teacher of Plato, was put on trial because he said he corrupted the youth and was teaching false doctrines. So he was given a choice for his penalty. They said, Socrates, you've been found guilty. You can do one of two things. You can kill yourself, or you can go into exile. You can leave this land and never come back. And Socrates chose to kill himself rather than leave and go into a foreign land. Because moving around was not something that people readily did. You left your town, you could very easily find yourself enslaved. 
You go into a foreign land, you can very easily find yourself in prison. And you can even find yourself murdered. You can be robbed. All kinds of bad things can happen to you. It was risky, it was dangerous to just travel anywhere in the ancient world. With that in mind, now you think when God told Abraham to get up and leave your country and go into a land that you've never been into before, you can see why that did call for tremendous faith and trust. We find the call of Abraham in the 12th chapter of Genesis. The Lord said to Abram, who would become Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. But did he? Did he do what the Lord told him to do? The way the Lord told him to do it. Verse 5, he took his wife, Sarai, would later become Sarah. Well, we give him that one. He would be expected to take his wife. But then he took his nephew, Lot. He took all of his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and he headed for the land of Canaan. Well, that's a little different than what the Lord had told them. The Lord says, leave your country, leave your relatives, leave your father's house, and go. Abraham took his wife, took his nephew, took all his money, his cattle, all the servants in his household, and then he went. Abraham didn't go by himself. He took a whole clan with him. Abraham says, I ain't staying in no sleazy motel. I'm taking me some money. I ain't gonna get jumped by bandits, not without a fight. I'm taking my posse. We read this, we kind of wonder, is there anyone or anything that Abraham didn't take with him? Well, what does this say? That sometimes when the Lord gives us direction and guidance, we don't always do it exactly the way the Lord called us to do it. We're like Abraham. We like our safety nets. We like to just tweak the Lord's word, the Lord's will, just enough to give us that level of comfort. That brings us to chapter 13. Lot, who was traveling with Abram, had also become very wealthy with his flocks and sheep and goats, herds of cattle, and many tents. Lot has now become rich, hanging out with Abraham. And that's not a surprise because the Lord told them, I will bless those who bless you. So Lot is making out okay here. But the land could not support both Abram and Lot with all their flocks and herds living so close together. So disputes broke out between the herdsmen of Abram and Lot. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perserites were also living in the land. Finally, Abram said to Lot, let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. After all, we are close relatives. The whole countryside is open to you. Take your choice 
of any section of the land you want, and we will separate. If you want the land to the left, then I'll take the land on the right. If you prefer the land on the right, then I'll go to the left. So understand what happened here. There's disputing among them, and they can't stay together anymore. Abraham says to Lot, I'm going to give you first dibs. You pick where you want to go. I'll let you choose. Now, Abraham didn't have to do this. He could have just said, you need to go back home. After all, Lot was traveling with Abraham. Abraham wasn't traveling with Lot. But he says, I'm going to be a nice guy. You pick first. You pick what you want for yourself, and I'll take the rest. Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of Jordan Valley in the direction of Sire. The whole area was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord or the beautiful land of Egypt. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot looks out and says, okay, I'm gonna take that land. Nice guy. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. Now, I want you to also notice that he took a place near Sodom. It was in eye view of Sodom. But the next time we read about Lot, he's in Sodom. And he's in trouble. And that's another message for another day. But where does that leave Abraham? Well, this happened in a place where they pitched their tents between Bethel and Ai, where they had camped before. Bethel was a barren land. There was nothing but rocks there. It wasn't like Lot's choice. It wasn't like the fertile grounds in the plains of Jordan. So now Abraham is standing there. Half his party is now gone. They picked the best land for themselves. And now Abraham is left standing there. Looking at a rocky terrain. And he at this point is feeling quite used and abused. He no doubt is thinking this is what happens with trying to be a nice guy. And it throws him into more uncertainty than he had when he first left. With less than what I started with. And it looks like I'm headed nowhere. It looks like I just forfeited the best parts of me. And now what am I going to do? Now I am in some serious uncertainty and serious anxiety because I don't know where I'm going to go from here. And this is where our text comes in. God visits him at this point a second time. God comes to him and says, look, as far as you can see, I'm giving you all this land. Go and walk through the land. In other words, what God is saying, Abraham, don't worry about what's coming around the corner. And it's interesting, he doesn't say to him, everything's going to be okay. You're never going to have another problem. But what he says is, I'm going to be with you. That you may not know where you're going. You may not know what's around the corner. You don't know what your future holds. But you can be sure that whatever it is, I'm going to be right by your side. That's why the psalmist says, but when I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. 
But we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. As we enter into this new year, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what sickness is going to come our way. We don't know if we're going to have a job to go to six months from now. But we do know that no matter what the future brings our way, if you got Jesus Christ in your life, then everything's going to be all right. Oh, hallelujah. He says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. When I know that I have God on my side, I may not know what's around the corner. I may not know what 2020 is going to bring me. But I can trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I don't know what next year has in store for me. I don't know if sickness is going to come my way. I don't know what my financial situation is going to look like. But I can know that God will always be there. I may have troubles. I may face problems. My friends might let me down. But Jesus Christ will always be there. He'll be there in the dark valleys. He'll be there on the mountaintops. Tops. I can go forward knowing that God is on my side. And if I got God on my side, he'll hold me up. He'll carry me through no matter what comes my way. Thank God I'm not going into the new year by myself. I'm not going into next year all alone. But I have Jesus on my side. He'll lift me up. He'll keep me comforted. He'll speak to my heart. He'll hold me together. He'll pick me up. He will hold me. Thank God my eyes are on Jesus. He'll take me through. He'll carry me on. He's given me 2020 vision. If I keep my eyes on Jesus. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, the sure foundation and his people as the stones he is building a place he can live brick after brick Stones. He is building a place he 